Test. I think it's working, yeah.
Right. Okay. I'd like to. Let's go ahead and turn this on. I'd like to go ahead. Oh, you still don't have it on, huh? Test. I'd like to go ahead and ask the seminarians to go ahead and take a seat. Those in the back. Good evening, everyone. I'm Father Anthony Brausch. I'm the rector and president of Mount St. Mary Seminary, the Athenaeum of Ohio. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening for the Hesburgh Lecture. Before we begin with uh, Father Dave Enters introducing our speaker, let us begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many gifts you pour about upon us. In a special way this evening, we thank you for the gift of the universality of our faith, that it includes all nations and peoples, that it is to be announced to all creation. We ask in a special way that you pour your grace into our hearts, that we might always receive well this challenge to speak your word of life to, to, all, to all those we encounter. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I ask you to give your attention to Father David Endres, the academic dean of the Athenaeum, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Tonight we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Peter Casarella. Dr. Casarella is associate professor in the Department of Theology at the University of Notre Dame. He's also director of the university's Latin American, North American Church Concerns Initiatives through the Kellogg Institute for International Studies. He is uh, very reputable in terms of uh, quite a lot of scholarly publications, uh, 60 essays in scholarly journals, and a good number of edited works, including Corpo de Cristo, the Hispanic presence in the US Catholic Church, Christian spirituality and the culture of modernity, and uh, most recently, Jesus Christ, the New Face of Social Progress, which is a series of essays reflecting on Pope Benedict XVI's encyclical Caritas and Veritate. And so we're very, very pleased tonight to be able to partner with the University of Notre Dame uh, Alumni Association and the Notre Dame Club of Greater Cincinnati to offer this Hesburgh le Lecture, which is in honor of Father Theodore Hesburgh, President of the University of Notre Dame from 1952 to 1987. So welcome, Dr. Casarella. Thank you, Father David. It's a great privilege to be here, and a double thank you to the Athenaeum of Ohio and to the Notre Dame Club for allowing me to come here. Um, coming from northern Indiana, from South Bend, I had the privilege of driving this afternoon uh, down to Cincinnati uh, to see the beautiful panorama of the river as you come into the city. But even before that, uh, in the midway through, uh, there's these farm roads that come off the highway, and there was one sign obviously made by a local farmer, made of wood, very rustic, and it said, Mexico, half mile. And then five miles later, there was a huge water tower towering up above, said Peru, Indiana. So I learned a lot coming here, and I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot tonight with this lecture. So just a basic overview of where we're going to go next 45 minutes or so. I, I mean, the title, Unwritten Future, just refers to the the growing Hispanic presence in the Catholic Church, and more importantly, what that means in terms of our sense of identity as a Catholic community, and in terms of Catholic theology as well. So the first part, we'll just talk about Latino identity, Latino presence, some of the myths and misconceptions. And then I'd like to go directly to the question about spirituality. Um, what is the, the gift, la bendición, that comes with the Hispanic presence uh, among us? And then at the end, after talking a little bit about the theology of popular piety from Hispanic-Latino perspective, I'll talk a little bit about the challenges for the future in terms of vocations, 
uh, the youth and the social impact of Latino Catholicism. So these are the four points, very basic points, uh, that I find uh, need to be addressed just at the outset, thinking about the Hispanic presence, Latino, Latina presence in the U.S. Catholic Church. Um, is it just a minority in the U.S. Catholic population that needs uh, help with masses in Spanish? Well, that's true. I mean, that's obviously true, and that's a big part of it, and the masses in Spanish are, are a significant aid in Hispanic ministry. But as we'll see in a minute, and I'll give you charts and demographics and so forth, um, to think of it as a minority might not be the most accurate way about thinking about the presence in terms of a demographic reality. But then you have so many different cultures that come together in the Hispanic presence, the Cuban, the Mexican, my own background as a Colombian American. Um, and then of course, even though we can talk about the question of poverty and the re outreach to the poor from within the, the domain of Hispanic ministry, not all Hispanics are poor either. You have, from many different cultures, people who are representing the whole uh, bandwidth of the socioeconomic uh, spectrum. So in terms of uh, just thinking about language is a kind of uh, short-sighted approach. Uh, we also have to think about the relationship between language and culture. Uh, on this third point, uh, the relationship between Hispanic identity and national identity, that gets to the question that is rather fundamental, I think, before we even get into the spirituality and theology about what it means to be Hispanic. Um, it's not like a national identity. I'm a U.S. citizen, I'm not a U.S. citizen, and with all the complications that go along with that. Um, most Hispanics first identify with a country of national origin, of their place of birth, or of their parents, or of their grandparents. So to be Hispanic is already to talk about a forged identity, an identity that comes from thinking and reflecting in a certain process of self-examination that relates to the fact that, as in my case, my mother is from Bogota, Colombia. And what does that mean for me? And how does it relate to my own faith and to my own life in the church? So there's, I mean, we can get into the technicalities of it, you know, is identity something that is fixed uh, by virtue of having a certain DNA, or is it something that I create uh, and make out of what I've been given by God and by my parents? And the answer that I would give to be, get to the point would be that it's a combination of the two. There's an element of, of nature, and then there's an element of nurture and self-examination. So that, that question about identity, which I'll get into in more depth, is a very interesting and important question. Um, and a lot of time there's, there's confusion about that, and it's interesting to reflect upon it. And then the question that I think is rather central, and that I'm gonna talk about a little bit this evening, is about Hispanic piety. I mean, the, the, the kind of critique that Latino theologians sometimes make on this score would be una pastoral de piñata. <laughs> a pastoral theology that's only based on the, the piñata, or the, the colorful display. So what I want to get into tonight is more the, the relationship between faith and culture and where uh, popular piety, or as we say in Spanish, religiosidad popular, the, the popular religiosity, is, comes from traditions of piety and Marian devotion, but then extends into a new way about thinking about faith and culture. So this is one of my favorite slides, that I, not just because I put myself there at the end of the list, because I have a Colombian mother and Italian American father, but I, I think this is another uh, aspect of the, the confusion or the misperception, is that you don't need to have a Mexican sounding last name to be a Latino or to be a Hispanic. So there's a lot of uh, generational things here and trying to find the right pictures for this slide, but, and I've changed it a lot over the years, uh, but Martin Sheen was born Ramon Gerard Antonio Esteves, and had a Spanish father. Raquel Welch was born Ra Raquel Tejada, had a Bolivian father. Bruno Mars, that's the most recent addition to this particular slide, uh, has a father from Puerto Rico and a mother from the Philippines. So you don't see that, I'm just looking at the name Bruno Mars. And Ted Williams, of all people, had a Mexican mother. So there's, for me, this is very important because you know I could, I could have like added Rojas to my name. It's my mother's maiden name, and be Peter Casero Rojas. You know, would that be better for marketing in terms of Hispanic ministry? But my mother put on the birth certificate put Peter Casero. That was the name she wanted me to have, so that's what I've always used in every context. But 
the, the point here is that there's more than meets the eye, and that when we talk about Hispanic presence, we have to kind of open up our eyes to, to being surprised and to thinking about things in a new way. Not many graphs, I promise you. I won't, I won't go too far with the demographics in the graphs, but this one is interesting. So um, if you just look at the different generations from pre-Vatican II, born before 1943, going up to the millennial, and we don't even have Generation Z or whatever up here yet. Uh, you need a more recent slide. This one I think is five or six years old, coming from the Bishop's Conference Office. But anyway, the point is to look at how the blue part of each of the bars is getting smaller and smaller as we look into the, the newer generation of U.S. Catholics. So it goes from those pre-Vatican II generation, 76%, to 39% for the millennial, millennial generation. There's different numbers and different sets of statistics, but the one that the, the Bishop's Conference uses here in terms of the percentage of the millennials, so of the younger generation of Catholics born 1982 or later, um, who are Hispanic, 54%. But also the, in, in other Pew Center studies and so forth, uh, the number that's used and cited very frequently in terms of uh, U.S. Catholics under 18 being two-thirds uh, Hispanic. So you might say that in my parish or in my diocese or in my pocket of the Catholic Church, um, it's still only a very small thing, and so what do we have to do? But we're looking at the U.S. Catholic Church as a whole. Uh, the future is clearly uh, related to what we're talking about this evening. If two-thirds of the Catholics under 18. Now, that, does that mean they stay? Does that mean they're on their way out, their way in? All those things we can, we can get into in Q&A to the degree I'm, I'm like a number. I'm a number taster. I'm not a number cruncher, but I'll give you what I know in terms of demographics on that one. But, but there's something there that we have to think about in terms of thinking about unwritten future or our U.S. Catholic presence. This is just meant to be a little bit provocative in thinking about what we mean when we talk about diversity. Um, so at, at the University of Notre Dame right now, and we can go into African Americans, Asian Americans, but I'm just kind of focusing on the Hispanic presence, giving you a sense of what we mean when we talk about a diverse population vis-a-vis -vis Hispanics. So at the University of Notre Dame right now, uh, the most recent statistics I was able to gather, 69% Anglo-American, 11% Hispanic, and I think, I'm not sure, that includes the Latin Americans. So we have at Notre Dame uh, kind of two buckets for talking about Spanish speakers or people with Spanish-speaking background, Latin Americans who, uh, by and large, tend to come very elite families, and then Hispanics, a lot from Texas, a lot from other, other parts of the country. Um, and, and that's an interesting dynamic. And, that's, and I'm very proud of that, and I'm happy to work with those students and teach those students as well as many others. But then let's compare it to other senses of diversity and some numbers on Hispanics. And the U.S. population as a whole, most recent numbers that I got were 63% Anglo-American, 17% Hispanic. But then what about the U.S. Catholic Church, the most recent numbers? And by this way, this number has gone down over the years that I've been talking about this issue. 59% white and 34% Hispanic. Not just the millennials, but just as a whole, 34%. But then this is my favorite set of numbers, global Catholicism. Like if you start thinking about diversity, we think Notre Dame, we can get from 11 to 12, it's like, hooray, you know, the Irish are winning. But I mean, if you think about the church as a whole, um, 32% Euro-American, 39% Latin American, but then if you put the Latinos in the U.S. together with the Latin Americans, 42% of the global Catholic Church is Spanish-speaking. And the number I've heard in terms of global Christianity is about 50% Spanish-speaking. So kind of the, 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 when you kind of zoom outward with your kind of mental GPS and start thinking about Catholicism and the church, it gets more diverse, not less diverse. And I think this is important because sometimes, at least maybe in my institution or in academia, people think you have to be, keep up with a secular model of multiculturalism. The most diverse form of cultural diversity that I am aware of is that of global Catholicism. I mean, you could talk about other dynamics and problems with the church, and I'm not trying to whitewash any of that, but global Catholicism itself is a high standard for talking about diversity. All right, let's get into a little bit of the question about identity. So to be a Latino or a Latina means you have some connection, either first generation, second generation, third generation, or some sense of connection to Latin American culture. 
The word in Spanish, mestizaje, is a very important word in this conversation. Um, it just means cultural blending, a blending of two different cultures. In English, the closest thing we have is not very mis miscegenation, a mixing of ancestries. It doesn't like trip off your tongue or, or mean too much, and it usually has meaning in different contexts than the one I'm going to talk about. So it's, it really only makes sense in uh, Spanish, although there's Portuguese and French equivalents, but I mean, it really only makes sense to talk about the blending in terms of the, the Spanish word, mestizaje. But of course, it comes out of the colonial history, and there's kind of a negative connotation to it, which I want to talk about first, and then there's a positive connotation to it, which my, my former colleague, Virgil Elizondo, developed in his writings that I'm going to talk about next. But the term in the colonial epic in Latin America was in its essence, I mean, it has a long history, but in its essence tied to a caste system. And this slide here is uh, one of many examples you could find of paintings that depict the caste uh, system. So in the caste system, uh, the, basically the, the, in terms of purity of blood, which was the technical term, um, the highest one in the hierarchy are the peninsulares, those who come directly from Spain. And the next down in the caste system are the criollos, those who are of Spanish descent but were born in Latin America. Then the mestizos, the mixed race, would be a combination of peninsular and those born in Latin America. And then farther down are those who have, because of the slave trade, uh, African and African-American blood, the mulatos. So you have to actually talk about mestizaje and mulates and how they relate to one another. And then at the very bottom of the caste system are Indians and slaves. The, 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 in Spanish, we call them original peoples. So mestizaje, in this sense, has a, has, is a very hierarchical, and it's not a very open or, or liberating way of thinking about identity. But Virgil de Sando was from San Antonio, Texas. And his many books um, talked about the, a new mestiza. And let me talk a little bit about that, about how he reconfigured and gave a positive sense to cultural blending. He was born in San Antonio, on the west side of San Antonio, and lived his whole life in the west side of San Antonio. In the, in the beautiful years in which he was a professor at Notre Dame, uh, he would commute from San Antonio to Notre Dame. And if you've ever been to South Bend Airport, you know that that's like a, a labor of love, a major sacrifice, um, even when there's no football game. And, um, but he maintained his roots. Um, but his basic idea, well, there's one idea related to the identity of Jesus, but let me just talk about his idea about Mestizaje and the new Mestizaje. It came from a trip that he made to Mexico, and particularly to the, in, in Mexico, they call it La Plaza de las Tres Culturas, the, the central plaza in Mexico City, Zocalo is the other name for it, where the indigenous, uh, the Spanish, and the Mexican identity all come together and are represented with different icons. But for Father Virgil, as a Latino, um, he recognized, and this is a, a, a universal, I want to claim as a universal experience, that in Spanish, and in Mexico, they would say his Spanish was too American. You know, why, why do you speak with an accent? And then in San Antonio, it's like, why do you speak with an accent? Nida acá, ni de allá. I'm not from here nor from there. So his point was, and in none of his books does he have this Venn Zen, Zen diagram, but in every one of his lectures he used it. And I, that's what I've actually, the most important thing I've appropriated from him is the Venn diagram to explain mestizaje. So he's Mexican because he grew up in a Mexican American family. Mother came from Mexico. And he spent his whole life in the U.S. I mean, the border moved. He didn't move. But the important thing is the purple, where the red and the blue intersect. And the point he wants to make about new mestizaje in terms of identity is that the purple is not a piece of you, okay? It's not like you have a left hand, which is Mexican, and a right hand, which is, has U.S. papers, and then like somewhere in between, like in the pituitary gland, there's something that's purple, okay? The point is that the purple runs through you, and it permeates your identity and your whole existence. I mean, it's an ex if you want to put it this way, it's an existential category, the purple. And mestizaje is a way of being um, that is a blessing and a gift and not something that has to be tied to a caste. It can be liberated from the caste system when it's seen in these terms. So whereas in Mexico, you're too American, in the US, you're too Mexican, he, his whole ministry, his whole message was based on the blessing, not the curse 
of being a mixed race person. Liturgically, um, it had other ramifications, which maybe I can come back to um, in a minute. So this is from Ohio. Um, I didn't have time to look up and see what's going on in terms of uh, El Señor de los Milagros, the Lord of the Miracles here in Cincinnati. But let me say a word about this before we get into kind of the spirituality side of it. Uh, this particular devotion is a favorite of mine um, because when I was in Washington, D.C., I taught for 14 years at the Catholic University of America, um, I, I just stumbled upon the Lord of the Miracles procession um, in, um, in DuPont Circle in the kind of central area of Washington, D.C., and uh, I accompanied them. Um, so this comes from Lima, and the crucified, the purple Christ, because of the purple background, uh, that you see here is a depiction of an image that was on a wall. Pachacamilla is the name of the, uh, a convent that was twice uh, disru uh, disrupted by earthquakes, but the wall stayed. And so the devotion to this particular image of the crucified Christ from Lima um, is processed. In Lima, it's mi two million people. Um, they call it the Lent in October. It's about the end of October, if I'm not mistaken and there'll be two million people in Lima. In Washington, D.C., it was actually an enormous group that would meet, and they would spend a whole year preparing for the procession of the Lord of Miracles. It had its own spirituality, liturgical formation. It was, it was a form of catechesis and a kind of small group sharing that met around the year. It wasn't just... But they process um, Peruvians and a few non-Peruvians through DuPont Circle uh, by the Washington Hilton where Reagan was shot. I wrote a whole article about the kind of meaning of the procession in Washington, D.C., but then what I discovered doing afterwards, after publishing my article about the Lord of the Miracles in Washington, D.C., is that almost every city has. Uh, Manila has Lord of the Miracles. I mean, Chicago is a huge one. New York has one. And Cle I found a parish in Cleveland that had it. So I'm still, I gotta do the research in Cincinnati, obviously. But, but it, the, re the ripple effect from Lima throughout the world of this particular uh, devotion and the way that it infuses people's lives and, and structures their faith is what interested me. Now, again, following my lead from Father Virgil and his book, Galilean Journey, I want to say a little bit about the encounter with Jesus. Um, so Father Virgil tried to develop the existential or kind of living sense of what it meant to see Jesus as someone from Galilee. And the basic, without going into a long lecture, the basic insight he got was from the fact that you have already in math, Matthew 4, 15, building on Isaiah 8, the idea of a Galilee of the Gentiles, um, that Galilee was a place unlike the more urban and cosmopolitan Jerusalem that had mixed races, that had people from San Antonio, basically, is what he was trying to say. Um, he wasn't talking about a social class, a proletariat, but he was talking about a way of being and how these, these fishermen were attracted to this tecton or carpenter uh, Jesus and, and the way they came together. Anyway, the way I want to focus this thought about Jesus the Galilean and what it means for the Hispanic presence is to refer to a, a homily. I won't read the whole thing, but it was a homily that Pope Francis gave in the Easter Vigil of 2013 in which he made a similar comment. Pope Francis preached, after the death of the Master, the disciples had scattered. Their faith had been utterly shaken. Everything seemed over. All their certainties had crumbled, and their hopes had died. But now that message of the women, incredible as it was, came first from the angel and then from Jesus himself. Let them go to Galilee. There they will see me. Jesus is preaching his miracles, the new community, the excitement and the defections, even the betrayal, to read everything starting from the end, which is a new beginning, from the supreme act of love. In the life of every Christian after baptism, there is also a more existential Galilee, the experience of a personal encounter with Jesus Christ who called me to follow him and to share in his mission. In this sense, returning to Galilee means reassuring in my heart the living memory of that call when Jesus passed my way, gazed at me with mercy, and asked me to follow him. It means reviving the memory of that moment when my eyes, when his eyes met mine, the moment when he made me realize that he loved me. So I want to focus on this kind of convergence between the theology of Father Virgil as the father of 
Latino theology and the, this homily of Pope Francis um, where he talks about existential Galilee. So this post-resurrection experience calling uh, the apostles to go back to Galilee where they began and where their ministry began is then translated by Pope Francis into an existential encounter with the one whom we love and the one from whom we receive our mission. So I think there's Pope Francis here, and by the way, I, I actually had a very good, uh, on Easter Sunday I wrote to Virgil, I said, the Pope is channeling your thoughts. He said, yes, he is. And so there's actually kind of some basis for thinking that there's a convergence here. The Pope is a Latino theologian. But I mean, the idea I think is this, that Galilee is not just um, like a point on the GPS. It's not just a place. Um, Galilee symbolically, I mean, there's a biblical concept of Galilee of the Gentiles, which points to diversity, kind of a Pentecost type diversity. But it's, the Pope has actually taken it one step further. Galilee is not just people from different socioeconomic strata, people from different cultures who are coming together now to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord, the one who died and raised on the third day. But Galilee is the point of departure for all missions. So whether you're from San Antonio or whether you're from Cincinnati or whether you're from South Bend, we're all sent from our existential Galilee. And it's actually a call to self-examination. Where is your Galilee? Is it because of your Italian-American grandparents? So that's my father's side of the family. Is it because of what you, the faith you received from your Colombian mother? Where is it from? Where did you get your faith from? And then where are you going to take it? So Galilee looks backwards in terms of memory and looks forwards in terms of discipleship. So I think that's an interesting and very flexible uh, notion, the existential Galilee, that, that is tied directly to these, these words uh, that Jesus gave us. One more point about popular piety. This particular devotion, the Divine Countenance in Spanish, El Divino Rostro, actually started in the 19th century Spain. In, in response to the cholera and was the sign of the sweating Jesus uh, was taken as a miraculous sign and a sign of healing in the midst of this terrible situation and then it spread to the, the Philippines. But interestingly, and this gets to the point of, you know, what is this sentimental piety and how is it to be integrated or understood or interpreted, but interestingly, El Divino Rostro is not just popular with Latinos but stands at the, at the center of Latino piety. Um, Roberto Coitueta tells a story in one of he's another Latino theologian, Cuban American, retired from Boston College, uh, tells a story about this image and the idea that uh, a Jesuit who was very interested in outreach to Hispanics went to visit uh, a woman who was in crisis and needed some help. And she brought him a picture, not a touchdown Jesus, but a, a picture of a risen Jesus, okay? And, um, and wanted to give that as a gift, as a real genuine sign of, of hope and inspiration to make her feel better. And she accepted it uh, kind of as a, said thank you and was being very polite about it. But she said, she says to the Jesuit, you see, Father, I have my divino rostro, I have my image of the crucified Christ. Uh, my son, I haven't seen him for for a year or two. I don't know where he is. And my daughter, I think she's, she's taking drugs or something. And um, when I look at the face of the crucified Christ, I know that, that he's with me. Um, she had found in Divino Rosso her existential galley. Uh, she had found in that encounter something that she couldn't find in just an upbeat, risen Christ. I mean, not that you separate the two theologically in the end, but. But there was a point there that the Jesuit, I think it's Jesuits, I mean, Jesuits can come attack me later, it's fine. It's all, it's all fair. But I mean, I, in other words, she had found only in this image, right? So central to Latino piety, uh, the source of her, of her sustenance, the source of her connection with, with Christ and with God. So what is, what is then the, popular, the power of popular piety? I'll read this first and then say a word about it. This is from uh, Joy of the Gospel, Evangelii Gaudium, uh, from Pope Francis, about uh, popular piety. What are we supposed to learn from the people of God? Genuine forms of popular religiosity are incarnate since they are born of the incarnation of Christian faith and popular culture. For this reason, they entail a personal relationship, not with big, vague spiritual energies or powers, 
but with God, with Christ, with Mary, with the saints. And this is the line that I, I find very uh, evocative and theologically interesting. These devotions are fleshy. They have a face. They are capable of fostering relationships and not just enabling escapism. I mean, and there's other references to this in, in Joy of the Gospel and other places in Pope Francis, the importance of popular piety. So the main thing I want to say about popular piety in, in Latino context, and you could look at it from other contexts as well, Latinos don't have any monopoly in popular piety, uh, but the main thing I want to say is that, as Pope Francis notes here, uh, the flesh of the image, whether it's Divino Rostro or Nuestro Señor de Guadalupe, um, is an invitation to encounter Christ, the flesh of Christ. Uh, it's a direct encounter with God. It's a direct form of self-examination. It's a moment for conversion and for, like, like in the existential galley, going out in missionary discipleship. Now, the, there's, there's, there's a second point, and the second point would be that um, in the history of the development of a theology of popular piety in Latin America and in Latino theology, um, there were some very important stages on the way. And the most important one was that um, popular piety didn't become less pious, but there was a deep and, and um, thorough examination of the relationship between faith and culture within the popular devotions. So what Pope Francis is saying, I mean, I, I want to just hit the right note here. He's not saying don't be Marian, don't, he's, he's promoting popular devotions. But not, and not for in some instrumental way, but to show that the whole question about how faith and culture comes together, the whole question about where my ethnic identity and the gift of faith I received from Jesus Christ comes together is in the popular piety. And that pastors, and no less lay people such as myself, need to learn from that. When I accompanied El Señor de los Milagros in Washington, D.C. Uh, for the first time, um, it rained in this eight-hour procession. And I was kind of a wimp and needed to go home and, and dry off. But I mean, the feligreses were there, walking all the way through Cal down California Avenue, through Adams Morgan and back to La Capilla by DuPont Circle. They didn't abandon Christ. And so there's a way of being converted to Christ more deeply through popular faith. How does that look from an evangelical perspective? How does that look in terms of other things like the director and popular party? We can get into that. In terms of the history of Latin America, I'll just give you a very short uh, version of what is a much larger and more interesting story. After Vatican II, uh, the big moment when Paul VI went to, first he went to Bogota, and then there was a, in Colombia, and then there was a meeting in Medellin in 1968. And, a lot of attention has been paid, particularly with the 50th anniversary of that Medellin meeting in 68 on the preferential option for the poor, which is incredibly important in terms of the history of the church and I think the future of Catholic theology. But in Medellin, there was not uh, the Medellin document, which is kind of the char charter for CELAM, the Latin American Episcopal Conference through the 60s, 70s, and 80s and today, um, there was not that em much emphasis on popular piety. And between 68 and 79, between Medellin and then the next big meeting of the Episcopal Conference of Latin America, CELAM, which took place in Puebla, Mexico, there were these meetings um, in different places. One was in Schoenstatt in Germany, Ratzinger, later Pope Benedict actually participated, and I have some students actually doing research on what took place between 68 and 79. But at any rate, the, what you have here in this slide is basically the theology of popular devotions as a form of enculturation that developed in the Puebla meeting of 79. And, um, and that's the so-called, and that's one of the key elements, if not the key element, of the Argentine theology of the people, Teología del Pueblo, that Pope Francis brought to the pontificate. And that was very interesting development. I'll just say one more word about that and then move on, because it's something I'm very interested in in terms of history and theology. But Juan Luis II, who was one of the more radical, I'll just call it that, of the liberation theologians from, from Uruguay, from the Southern Cone, uh, didn't like this new development of adding popular piety to liberation theology, which in his view was like unnecessary because he thought it was opiate of the people. He thought this popular piety gets people away from social justice and doing real activist stuff. So Juan Luis II called the theology of people like Lucio Herra, the father of Argentine theology people, basically the template for Pope Francis theology, 
They're just doing theology of the people with popular piety. Anyway, that's now the name of the Pope's kind of school of theology, theology of the people. And it's actually what you see in this in, uh, apostolic exhortation here, Evangelii Gaudium that I'm citing, is the theology of the people that the, the more radical, the liberation theologians despise and tried to get rid of. Uh, and that's one of the things that Pope Francis brought to the uh, pontificate. Anyway, I can go on about that if you're interested, but devotions are fleshy, they have a face. They enable an encounter with Christ. Um, this is another element of Pope Francis' theology that I want to uh, kind of highlight here. God lives in the city, and about the kind of social inflection, the social dimension of the theology of the people. In our cities, faith is weak or has disappeared. What are we to do? What is called for is an evangelization capable of shedding light on these new ways of relating to God, to others, to the world around us, and inspiring essential values. It must reach the places where new narratives and paradigms are being formed, bringing the word of Jesus to the inmost soul of our cities. Cities are multicultural. In the larger cities, a connective network is found in which groups of people share a common imagination and dreams about life. And new human interactions arise, new cultures, invisible cities. Various subcultures exist side by side and often practice segregation and violence. The church is called to be at the service of a difficult dialogue. So, Jorge Mario Bergoglio, now Pope Francis, was a rector of the Jesuit seminary. It's called San Miguel on the outskirts of Buenos Aires. Um, right before he became Archbishop of Buenos Aires, before he became Pope. Um, but I, I went and visited Buenos Aires when I was uh, 2014, 15. I lived in Latin America, and I went and visited Buenos Aires, and I went and visited the seminary. And so I asked people, like, what did he teach? What, what was like his theology like back then? And, and most importantly, for my own, satisfy my own curiosity, but also as a theologian interested in studying his, the roots of his thinking, um, as from a Latino perspective, I said, like, is it true the things they say about him? So on the first point, what did he teach? He taught pastoral theology. And in fact, this, what you find in this paragraph here of Evangelii Gaudium is basically the essence of what, what he did, pastoral theology. But he didn't, anyway, I can go into what kind of text he used. He had a very, he taught pastoral theology, but he made uh, students read about the Bishop of Rome as a pastor, which was kind of not the liberationist approach they were the, the more left-leaning Jesuits were expecting or wanted. And he was known as a very arch-conservative that, for that reason. Um, he had a very unique perspective on it. But on the second point, and I can say more about that, but on the second point I said, like, is it true that he was, like, humble and didn't do much stuff, stuff like, that uh, wasn't interested in the accoutrements or the, the kind of... Uh, is, is it true that, that w what they say about him? So, first of all, they said he did take the subway. Second of all, I talked to people who were like his drivers for an annual charity in such and such a place, and they said, he drove. I don't know why he didn't take the driver. And this is the, the third point is the one that I don't understand. As someone who's visited Argentina, point of many times, he never went out to dinner afterwards. Like, do you know how unusual that is? He went home, he went home to cook a dinner for another priest who lived in his residence, who he was serving, and, and didn't go to these steak restaurants in Buenos Aires. Anyway, the point is, he was, he was known before he became Pope as austere and taking the subway and living with the people. And we can, we can also talk more about his engagement with Jews and other kind of more high-profile things, but that, that was something I personally wanted to ask. Like, is it true what they say about his personality or his style? So God lives in the city is, that, is the notion related to the fleshiness of the popular devotions that... Um, the, the presence of the church on many different uh, levels, social ministry and popular piety, in the midst of everyday life, in the midst of urban chaos. Uh, that's what he tried to promote and that's what he wanted people to think about. Which then gets me to this slide just from uh, a kind of popular depiction of uh, Our Lady Guadalupe in, in L.A. Um, you know, it's not... not, not it's the image from Tepeyac, it's the image from the shrine in Mexico City, but, and you see this in urban centers everywhere. 
This is the, I mean, it fits with the Pope's theology, but it's also a very central Latino idea, the, the God of lo cotidiano, the God of the everyday. Uh, walking the streets, um, we encounter the poor. Walking the streets, we have to show our spirituality. We have to show and invite people to an encounter with Christ. Let me turn now to some of the challenges. Um, this is an old slide. Um, I need to get more recent data on this, but it'll help me make the point. Um, a survey from 2013 of the Bishops' Conference on priests. There's, there's not enough Latino vocations. I mean, that's the point of this. Um, among U.S.-born Latinos from the 2013 survey, under 5%. So if we have 34% Latinos and growing, under 5%. Um, total Hispanic Latino, including people from Latin America, 15%. Um, so there's a disparity there. You guys are working on vocations and know a lot about it. I didn't need to tell you that, but it's, it's an issue. And the more important issue, or an equally important issue, is about culture and faith. So a lot of Hispanic families, I mean, maybe part of it is socioeconomic, um, but there's also the issue that Father Virgil and others have talked about that some Hispanic families are kind of afraid of their, their, their son becoming a priest. Are they going to become assimilated? Are they going to lose them? I mean, are they going to become detached from uh, the life of the people? Uh, and that was something that Father Virgil uh, uh, worried about, not to the detriment of promoting vocation, quite the opposite. He was uh, very strong in that, even going to see the, the young seminarians down in San Antonio all the time and encouraging them. But there's a question then that about what, what might be the fears that, that Latino families have um, associated with this. And that's, that's, I mean, we can't have a church without priests. And that, that question, I don't have any answers to it, but if we're gonna talk about challenges for the future, that has to be one of the, one of the ones uh, uh, addressed. Now on permanent deacons in Hispanics, I have a lot to say, but I'll leave that for Q&A. This is the most complicated question of my entire presentation um, about the youth. So let me try to uh, just give some general patterns and um, also point to some, some good signs. Um, years ago, Alan Figueroa Deck um, from Los Angeles wrote a study on generational change uh, and talked about wa waves of Hispanic presence and how if you were born in Mexico and then your children come to the US, they have a totally different experience. And then once you get to the third generation, so it, what happens in terms of faith, what happens in terms of language, what happens in terms of culture, what happens in terms of the general Catholic ethos. Um, the experience, maybe not here, but I mean, uh, the experience in the Euro-American groups is basically seen to be assimilation, um, that there's a gradual weaning of that. I went with my Italian grandmother uh, to mass on Saturday night and she said a rosary during during mass, and I had that experience of her immigrant faith. My father was very proud of his Italian origins, but would have nothing of it. I mean, he was assimilated, he doesn't know Italian. He didn't hear me say that, but anyway. But I mean, that, that kind of pattern I know from that side of my family, the assimilation. And so, uh, the, the Latino experience is not like that, but, it's, but it's, it's incredibly complex, and there's a lot of data on it. One book I would recommend, I know this is kind of academic thing, punting, but Our Catholic Children, uh, in Spanish, it's a kind of bilingual book published by OS, our Sunday visitor, Nuestro, Nuestros Jóvenes Católicos, published by my friend and colleague Osman Ospino, uh, is very good on this and goes through many different dimensions of it. Um, the challenges regarding Catholic education, which are many and multifaceted, but also the, the fact that you have to think about different socioeconomic backgrounds, youth at risk, gangs, a huge issue. Um, and other such things. Um, my colleague Christian Smith has done a little, who's the expert on Catholic youth, and uh, is the one who coined this phrase in general with respect to Catholic youth, moralistic therapeutic deism. Um, a lot of people in ministry have read Christian Smith on this issue. So moralistic meaning that they don't necessarily have a kind of good compass, but they know that religion has to do with right and wrong and some people are going to be punished and some people are going to get rewards but like moral not necessarily moral theology therapeutic is yeah but we got to talk about it for a long time and it's okay to be leaving god but you know i can't you know step on your toes so long discussions and it's not a bad thing but i mean just infinitum and then 
deism, not in the sense of 18th century philosophy, but in the sense that God is kind of, he calls it the divine butler, right? I mean, kind of a presence, but let's not prove his existence or talk about Trinity or anything complicated. So, I mean, that's Smith's kind of grab bag term based on like huge amount of demographic number crunching on the situation with youth, religion, uh, religious uh, attitudes in the United States and, and even among Catholics. And on Hispanics, um, he has one chapter in that, one of the more recent books, he didn't find too much divergence. But, but Smith looks more at not just the elites, but on kind of a higher socioeconomic realm. Um, so two things. So this is a very complex question about generational change. You can't assume, uh, talking about Hispanic youth, that there's one type of Hispanic youth because of the difference of generations, difference of language. You can't assume that, that Hispanic youth speak Spanish or want to speak Spanish. And you don't have to speak Spanish to be Latino. That's, that's something I deal with a lot with my students here. I can't do Latino theology. I don't know Spanish. Who cares? I mean, that's, that's not the issue. Anyway, so two things to kind of summarize this point because it's very complicated. The first is, I think, the witness of the um, Franciscan friar in New York, the kind of successor to Benedict Rochelle, Augustino Torres, is really amazing. Cor uh, corazón puro. Uh, Augustino Torres, Tor uh, he's a... Mexican-American who has been reflecting on the fact that every 30 seconds another Hispanic turns 18 and basically taking theology of the body and stuff like that to young Latino at-risk communities and trying to communicate that message. I would, I would encourage you to look it up in terms of uh, seeing a really evangelical and deeply Franciscan effort to address this issue head on. Corazón puro and Father Agustino Torres. Second is, is very anecdotal but I'm going to try to summarize my thoughts about the youth with this. And by the way, the Quinto Encuentro, which took place almost a year ago, has reams of material on this and tons of kind of perspectives and data. But anyway, my, my anecdote on the, on the youth was a, a student I had when I was teaching at DePaul. And DePaul, you know, it's five campuses, but it happened to be I was teaching in the Loop, so in the center of Chicago, teaching a course on uh, introduction to Catholicism. And this particular student was Mexican-American from the south side of Chicago who... Um, we're studying computing and digital media. So future animator of America. Um, very high tech stuff. And she came up to me after a class in which I made a few comments about Latino theology. She said, do I have permission to write a paper about Latino theology? I'm thinking to myself, permission? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of the whole point. I'm trying to encourage people to get interested in this. And I said, well, why, why do you need, why are you asking for permission? And then she opened up a bit and she said, so she's a very high tech uh, field of studies and going to be a brilliant uh, engineer of digital media and so forth and computing. Well, she, she explained, she said, well, like in the loop when I'm in Chicago studying, I don't really think about being Mexican. I don't really. It's in the summer when I go back to Mexico, I'm with my abuelita, and they're practicing devotions that I'm Mexican. I said, well, maybe in your paper you could try to bring the two sides of your life together and try to think about integration. Anyway, that's my kind of parable, about, not just about the youth, but about the whole question of identity. The identity is the question is not like, can you be Mexican enough? Can you be an American enough? Are you gonna make money in the US? Are you gonna love your abuelita? The real question about the purple intersection is about finding a way to discern, in a, in a spiritual way, uh, the integration of the different parts and bring them together. Anyway, she wrote the paper, and I hope it was a good exercise. So a little bit then about the social challenge. I'm going to focus on this address, um, and then we'll, we can kind of bring things together. Um, so when Pope Francis went to the World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia, before that he gave a, a talk in Liberty Square. I don't know if you remember it or it's on your radar screen. Uh, but the first thing I want you to do is look at the lectern. Maybe someone knows about the symbols of lectern. They say the Pope has two kinds of encyclicals, the written encyclicals and the encyclical of gestures. Well, in this case, the lectern is the encyclical of gestures. It's Lincoln's lectern from the Gettysburg Address. Lincoln's lectern from the Gettysburg Address. Like he didn't have to say anything. I mean, just as a, as a pope uh, standing in front of Liberty Hall where the Constitution and Declaration of Independence were signed, 
speaking about both religious liberty and Hispanic presence, these big topics for the U.S. church, for the U.S. polity, using Lincoln's lectern, the same lectern that, that the Gettysburg Address was on when Lincoln spoke about reuniting the country. Like he didn't even have to have a speech, right? Just standing there with Lincoln's lectern was enough for me. But what did he say? So, I mean, I'm not going to read all this. It's a very interesting speech, and I would call your attention to it. First of all, it was delivered in Spanish. I mean, there were translations available, but it was delivered in Spanish, which I think is interesting. Delivering, I think that was deliberate, right, to deliver a speech in Spanish in front of Liberty, in Liberty Square, in front of the, the building where the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were signed. But there were two things he brought together. First, he talked about the problem of religious liberty, which, as you know, is a very important issue, questions of conscience and freedom. Uh, the protection of our, our, our right to life ideas, um, our ideas about marriage are under the gun in many different contexts, and he supported that. But then in the very same speech, he rounded it out by, uh, among us, with these, these words, I'll just give you a few of them, which I think are interesting, particularly in that context. Among us today are members of America's large Hispanic population, as well as representatives of recent immigrants to the United States. I greet all of you with particular affection. Many of you, so the Latino Pope, the Argentine Pope, speaking in Spanish. Many of you have emigrated to this country at great personal cost, but in the hope of building a new life. Do not be discouraged by whatever challenges and hardships you face. I ask you not to forget that, like those who came here before you, you bring many gifts to your new nation. You should never be ashamed of your traditions. Do not forget the lessons you learned from your elders at which something you can bring to enrich life which are something you can bring to enrich the life of this American land. I repeat, do not be ashamed what is part of you, your lifeblood. You are also called to be responsible citizens to contribute fruitfully to the life of the communities in which you live. I think in particular the vibrant faith which so, which so many of you possess, the deep sense of family life and all those other values which you have inherited. By contributing your gifts, you will not only find your place here, you will help to renew society with, from within. So speaking in Spanish to the Hispanic population there gathered. He was going to go to the World Meeting of Families, so the, all the, the question about family life and, and those issues were, were still about to be addressed. But even before that, I mean, Hispanic ministry for the Pope, I think, starts with the passing on of stories from the abuelita to the nietos, from the grandmother to the grandchildren. And that we need to foster that, not just as a cultural, ethnic heritage, but woven together with the question on, of passing on the message that we receive from Christ. So there's huge challenges, vocations, I mean, on all the levels, I just focused on priesthood here tonight, um, generational change, and the challenges I'll bring with them, and then the, the social questions, and I haven't even talked about immigration and, and things like that, which we get into. But I'll end with, with then this word from uh, Rejoice and Be Glad from 2018, because I think we do have to end with hope, even though the challenges sometimes seem insurmountable. So the Pope said there, I think this is a good Latino message, look at Jesus. His deep compassion reached out to others. It did not make him hesitant, timid, or self-conscious, as so, ha so often happens with us, quite the opposite. His compassion made him go out actively to preach and to send others on a mission of healing and liberation. Let us acknowledge our weakness, but allow Jesus to lay hold of it and send us to mission two. We are weak, yet we hold a treasure that can enlarge us and can make those who receive it better and happier. Boldness and apostolic courage are an essential part of the mission. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, we do have a few moments for questions if anyone uh, would like to uh, offer a question to Dr. Casarella. Yeah, right up here front. At the beginning, I saw kind of an interchange between, uh, it seemed like the word Hispanic and Latino were used up in the same interchangeably. Are they the same thing or are they different? Uh, a very astute comment. The question, I don't know if everyone heard, the question is, are Hispanic as a term of identification and Latino interchangeable? So the answer is yes, I was using them interchangeably. And I should probably stop there because it's a very much longer answer. So. Uh, 
at a certain point, and I've just told this, it started with the Los Angeles Times of all places, uh, Hispanic was thought to be too European a term. Uh, and then so it's kind of really started not from the church or even the academy, but really in the popular media, say we have to replace it with Latino. Um, and actually the journal that the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians uses was called the Journal of Hispanic slash Latino Theology, because that was the point of transition. Now Hispanic is kind of politically incorrect for that reason, but even Latino, because it ends with the male O, right, the male uh, case ending is a problem, and then it was Latino, Latina, and Latin X. So what I, I didn't get into that, because you know, like we can spend the whole night talking about language, and I'd rather talk about the process of being Latino and how mestizaje and new mestizaje or ways of thinking about that and the, the element of faith and discernment. But you're absolutely right. There's a lot of politics uh, of identity wrapped up with this. And um, it's a good question. Thank you. You mentioned you'd uh, leave the question of deacons for the Q&A. So would you like to speak on the uh, potential of Deacons, lay, lay deacons, thank you. It's good to see you, thank you for coming. Um, I, so uh, I, don't, I don't have any demographics. Uh, I know that uh, there's a Hispanic deacon group uh, that meets regularly nationally and I've been trying to work with that. Um, so I'll tell two anecdotes uh, about why I think it's an important topic. One is that there, uh, Adrian Bautista, who uh, did a degree in Latino studies at Ohio State or something like that. Some, he works at Oberlin, actually. Uh, wrote a, a doctoral thesis on the deacons in northern Ohio uh, because his uncle was a Hispanic deacon. He's Mexican-American. And the title of his thesis is Vatos Sagrados, the Holy Homeboys. Um, and his thesis is really interesting because it's, not so, it's a little bit on ecclesiology and, um, and theology, but it's more about the social tissue that was kept together that he first experienced it with his uncle and then he did like surveys and he got together information about how in northern Ohio uh, the deacons were so important in the transmission of faith and in the community. Uh, so that's one kind of witness. And you can, you can download it or write to Adrian and get it. It's a very interesting study that no one really talks about in theology because he did it in Latino studies. And then the second is just of my experience in Fort Wayne, South Bend. So when I came to the diocese in, in 2013, um, the bishop was starting a Hispanic deacon cohort. And uh, a year, a, a little over a year ago, we graduated 11 men as Hispanic permanent deacons. And you may know that in northern Indiana, particularly because of the RV industry, there's been a huge influx in the last 20 years of Mexicans uh, to work in, on that. And, that's, and they had no real help. They had one or two Spanish-speaking priests. So it's been, in our diocese, Fort Wayne, South Bend, it's been transformational that we have 11 guys. Now, 11 guys, what is that? That's actually a lot in, 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 in a dynamic that the pre, not just that the priests have help, but that there's presence in the community of leadership. What I found uh, teaching them and accompanying them and now working on the continuing education program for the Hispanic Permanent Deacons of Fort Wayne South Bend is that they were, I don't know, this is probably theologically incorrect, from my lay kind of amateur perspective, they were already doing diaconia. I mean, they were taking bread to sick people in the middle of the night uh, for years before they entered the program. And we, uh, our bishop made sure they got a rigorous theological program and that their, and their preaching skills are ship shape and all that. But in terms of leadership and representation, so in terms of theology and church and preaching, I think it's been transformational. But on this other level, symbolically, the Vatos Sagrados, I mean, having leadership and representation for these men and their wives has been uh, very important. That, that's another kind of delicate question, but some people have been looked into. Does that help? Um, hi. Um, I'm a youth minister, and I'd say 100% of my kids are immigrants and refugees. Okay. So 
our church is a little bit different. You don't have the majority as Americans. So it, the majority is either Africans or Guatemalans is our primary. Yeah. Um, and one thing we notice when you're talking about like piety and well, even spirituality is we have a lot of charismatic and I didn't hear you talk about charismatic movement in the Latino community and how, like for me, I have to help connect the children to the American, you know, spirituality too, because they're going to be growing up, you know, in other churches as they move out. And I'm trying to like help transition them and show them, you know, there is this spirituality and charisms um, that, you know, they shouldn't lose. You know, there's uh, the spirituality that we don't want them to drop. We don't want them to lose, uh, drop their parents' spirituality and say, okay, that's just, you know, their pastime, and I need to do something different. So we're trying to help make bridges. And so I didn't hear you talk about charismatic movement and, and that part in the Latino Can I just uh, ask you a question about that? I mean, what is your kind of quick evaluation of the role of the charismatic in terms of ethnic identity and their, their sense of faith? Uh, they're very strong in their faith, and um, there's a lot of vocal prayer, and um, they, our community, they're tremendous teachers tremendous teachers they you know they're the ones they're leading a lot of the teachings uh, they're joining the catechism groups and stuff and collecting a lot of Latinos that um, haven't found a church they said it's easy to invite a Latino to a church because it's they're bringing them into community um, or some of them that haven't had a faith they're kind of as they're coming across the border so they're I say their charisms are you know they're great teachers and uh, but it's a lot of vocal prayer and you see you showed a lot of images and stuff and I say they're probably less image oriented um, at least our Guatemalans and um, very spiritual music is tremendous um, I'd say that's you know we use like different senses you know in our church and I say music it was a big and vocal prayer um, I didn't see that coming out in your talk so uh, this is a very good question. Um, actually, September 19th to 21st, there was a huge conference at Boston College on Hispanic ministry and the ecclesial movement. So it was basically started by people like Andres Arango, who's the Vatican representative to the Hispanic Charismatic Movement in the U.S., Hispanic Charismatic Renewal in the U.S., to, to look at this dynamic about why so many Hispanics are, I mean, it was looking at all the ecclesial uh, movements, but it was actually in particular uh, inspired having helped a bit with the consultation prior because of the, the huge presence. And then the Quinto Encuentro, uh, that was very visible and very much a part of my experience. So I'm not from the charismatic renewal, although I've had uh, some experience. So I don't really have an answer to you. I think it's, it's, it's being uh, kind of analyzed. I think that there, it's undeniable that there's some affinity between Hispanic Charismatic Renewal in particular. Corsios de Cristiandad, which is slightly different, but it's related. Uh, if you look at the literature on the growth of Hispanic ministry, it played a, a huge role. I'll just leave it as an open question. I have opinions about it, but I mean, you're right at the forefront. I think we have someone who wants to say something about this. Por favor. More than a question is a comment. I am a bilingual pastoral associate in a parish which is growing, the Hispanic community is growing very fast, mostly from Guatemala, the parish that I am serving now. What I have noticed in California, and here is no difference, the reason why charismatic groups are growing and growing at national level in the United States is because as you expressed already, a Spanish community, I am from Mexico, we bring our own spirituality. When we come to the United States, we find out that the pastors from European descendants, they do not understand our spirituality. So these people who tend very much to the encounter with Jesus through scriptures, they love scriptures and because they feel not understood in the parishes, they form pray groups, and they pray together in their own way, in their own faith. And these groups grow and grow and grow. Uh, one of the reasons is that 
because they are making their own church through their own faith in the Catholic Church in the United States because they are not understood. No, uh, we have um, very few pastors. We, are, we already know priests in all the United States. Who's going to help them? Now, if we, uh, in addition to a few priests, and most of them are European descendants, that's why we are having this phenomenon, wonderful and beautiful phenomenon of charismatic groups. And, and there is a misunderstanding for some people to see them as a um, fanatic, sometimes ignorant, but those are misunderstandings. These people have a very deep faith in God and in the saints, saints in Jesus, and all of these people are alive, and it's a very real relationship, and it's a big faith. And in, an, in addition to that, when people come from other country and they are here alone and they left behind everything in their country, what the most these people need is God, but the God they know. Thank you. Mil gracias. I like what you said, because I think the Catholic Church has an important role in the time and history here with the avalanche or whatever numbers are coming from Latin America. I came, I came from Bolivia, and when I came here to Cincinnati, there were no more than 12 Latinos or Hispanic, which is, I'm glad where you mentioned that, the difference with, between the two words. But the challenge for the American Catholic Church is how you can respond to these numbers of people are coming. Because we're no different from the European who came here. They're running out of poverty. They're running out of oppression. There's no liberty. There's no democracy in Latin America. There are very few exceptions. But we have a common denominator, which is the Catholic faith or the Christianity, the, and so on. So the big difference for, for whatever you come from, but we have a common denominator. And one is the Catholic Church, because by tradition, Latin America was always Catholic. Now, here in the Midwest, recently now, the numbers are coming. And I hope that we can respond, whatever we can do to help, like the future of the, the United States for me, you cannot ignore the Latinos or the Hispanics. So I appreciate you that you mentioned also Virgilio Elizondo, because I read a lot about him, I knew him, and he has been a good contributor to Notre Dame and to the Catholic Church. So I just want to thank you for the seminary here <laughs> to bring a speaker like you, and that's all I wanted to say. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Castorella. I'm sure that Dr. Casarella is willing to stay around for a few minutes if anyone wishes to approach him individually. Thank you and have a great night. God bless.